we'll be discussing a little different aspect of endoscopic surgery, which is a little different from the conventional surgery which we were doing in retina and glaucoma. And this is regarding an endoscope which is really a thin scope having laser, light and camera all in one. And for the brief introduction about this, I would like to invite Mr. Bipin Sharma from the company to just give a brief overview and then we can start with the regular proceedings. Mr. Bipin. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Bipin Sharma, and on behalf of my company Beaver Visitec International, I welcome you all. Uh, I would like to tell you this very shortly about the introduction of this company. Uh, it was earlier a BD Pecton and Dickinson of company and known for syringes, cannulas, and blades and knives. And in 2010, BD separated the ophthalmic division and we formed a separate vertical name, Weaver Visited International. And then in 2010, our vision was to be a number one company in single use as in European countries and in American countries, we'll always uh, use the, uh, every any disposable as single use or single patient use. And we realized that, in, but for Asian market, uh, since the economy and the capacity is different as for the European or American uh, society. We have come up with a low cost product and, that, and we also acquired few companies in all the segments like Melosa Medical and Vitrex and in 2015 we acquired Indo Optics, a well known company, a, a company which has a very good technology in one probe, light source, camera and laser. All the details will come by Mr. Rich Kamara very soon and you will enjoy this session very nicely. Thanks a lot. Thank you Mr. Vivek for the wonderful overview of this <clears throat> product. Uh, today, we will be discussing three topics and the first part will be the cyclodestructive procedures in glaucoma management and it is by none other than a well-known renowned professor of our own nearest to our heart, Professor Dr. Najib Nas, sir. Uh, may I welcome, sir? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will first extend my respect, my regards to my teacher here, Professor Neem Pratap, sir, in the audience. And I also extend a very hearty welcome to Mr. Richard Kamara and his team who have come all the way from USA to, to tell us about this new procedure about which has a large, which has a very good application in all types of glaucoma. However, in advanced glaucoma situations, whatever be the etiology of glaucoma, cyclodestructive procedures have been practiced since a long time to relieve the patients of their pain in a painful blind eye. When the visual potential in those eyes has already hit the bottom. Only those were the eyes where glaucoma destructive procedure, where cyclodestructive procedures were performed earlier. They were not in, they were not used in seeing eyes due to possibility of initial temporary, but a quite a long period of rise in intraocular pressure. There used to be a very high peak which used to persist for maybe several days to several weeks, and also due to possibility of an atrophic bulbi or a thysis bulbi later on which used to be quite unsightly and unacceptable to patient. Earlier the patient used to accept it but now it has become more and more unacceptable as patients have become more, uh, you know, uh, more demanding about their cosmetic appearance. At places where even the cyclodestructive procedures were not available, we used to have the only option of enucleation in a painful blind eye. These cyclodestructive procedures have also come a long way now. And today we are looking at a cyclodestructive alternative to trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. And this is what this ECP is. The studies done on ECP have claimed that this ECP is better alternative to filtering surgery in several situations. And as we shall go through these slides, 
I will try to summarize all these points which I have mentioned till now. Psychodestructive procedures for treatment of glaucoma. The aim is to destroy the secretory epithelium of the ciliary body which secretes the hyper semen and thereby the destruction of this epithelium results in reduction in production of hyper tumor. Uh, but since the ciliary epithelium can regenerate, therefore often we require multiple treatments. And for long time, cyclodestructive procedures have been considered as a last resort treatment as I just spoke. The various modalities used were diathermy. I used to see diathermy only when I was a student and uh, often it used to lead to thinning of the sclera and the uveal prolapse through the thinned sclera and often the eyes used to become very atrophic later on. It was quite a painful procedure also despite somehow I have an inkling that it used to be painful to patients despite retrovulvar anesthesia. Surgical excision of uh, ciliary body I have never seen, it is just mentioned in the literature. I have never seen or practiced. Cryotherapy was definitely a very popular alternative, cyclocryo, but again the disadvantage was, was that initially there used to be a very high peak for a long time and the patient had to be kept on a very high doses of oral estrazolamide, glycerine as well as the topical medications to control that peak for a week or two. Laser cytophotocoagulation is the most commonly used one in today's practice. The benefits of this procedure is that it is a non-invasive procedure, you are not entering into the eye. And therefore there is increased safety in several respects and the patient is able to resume back his normal activities after the procedure and it is less painful than trial. Now ECP about which we are going to talk today, endocyclophotocoagulation, this there is a laser unit, it has got four different components. The first is the diode laser itself, a xenon light source, a helium neon, neon laser aiming beam and a video monitor and recorder. For a human eye glaucoma, when we have to manage glaucoma as well as cataract together, there is often a, a difference of opinion whether we should do a single procedure first, do both the things one by one or do them together. With ECP, we can do them together very easily because we already make a clear coronal incision for phacoemulsification which is just the appropriate size for doing the ECP also. We don't have to make any additional incision and the procedure takes only 2 or 3 or 4 minutes. After it can be done though it can be done before cataract surgery as well but after we are done with our phacoemulsification and lens implantation through the dilated pupil we just take the probe uh, behind the iris in front of the lens and then the we are able to visualize in the monitor as shown in the diagram here. The ciliary processes can be identified. We can identify the valleys as well as the hills of the ciliary process and uh, laser photocoagulation can be performed after the red aiming beam is focused at a particular area. The goal of each laser application is to whiten and shrink the ciliary process. As laser is applied and the we destroy the ciliary body, it becomes white in color and that shows us that we have treated that portion of the ciliary body sufficiently and then the probe is rotated in a, by few degrees so that we, are, we keep on destroying the ciliary body and approximately uh, 200 degrees or even more can be done in one sitting. Even 270 to 360 degrees people have been doing depending on the severity of glaucoma. In pseudophagic and aphagic patients, a parse plana approach can be advantageous if we are doing it at a later stage. It can be combined with the cataract surgery as I just said. The benefits of cyclophotocoagulation is that it is a safe and effective procedure for reduction of intraocular pressure. We have a direct visualization of the area which is being treated. Transescleral approach is a blind approach. We simply hear the pop sound, the audible pop sound which, which tells us that yes, the ciliary body has now been destroyed in this particular area. But here we visualize and we are able to see that ciliary body has been destroyed and it can be combined with the frequency. Several large studies have been done and they have been published in leading ophthalmology journals 
and they all show that this procedure is very promising in terms of control of glaucoma. Burke et al. they analyzed the results of combined FACO emulsification and ECP, which they performed on 626 eyes having cataract with glaucoma. And they compared it with a comparable cohort of 81 eyes. Naturally, it was not a randomized controlled trial, but they compared two cohorts. Such a study design has its own limitations and possibility of biases. However, since the sample size is very large and it has been done by the same group of people, therefore, we do have things to believe also. So, 81 eye of eyes which underwent FACO emulsification alone. This study was conducted in New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is a very large hospital. It has an associate, just like as we have Gandhi Memorial Associated Hospital with Haiti Union, so like they have a very big hospital called Montefiore. So, um, look at the large sample size. The pre op pressure, intraocular pressure in these patients on an average was 19, with a standard deviation of 4, and the post op was 15.7, a reduction of around 2.5 millimeters of mercury. It's not very significant, but then it is quite acceptable. And since you are not doing anything great, therefore, it's the reduction of this intraocular pressure also re results in a reduction of use of post glaucoma medication. Preoperatively, these patients of this group, they were using say 1.5 and post op only 0.6, that means less than 1 on an average. So, less post op medications are required, which is a distinct advantage. The pressure has also reduced and the number of medications has also reduced. Now, these medications, as we all are aware, treatment of glaucoma is more symptomatic than glaucoma itself. We all know this. All the medicines cause side effects, whether they are prostaglandin analogs or they are sympathomimetic, or drugs or carbonic anhydrism, whatever, pilocarpine, anything. They all cause side effects and often the patient comes to us saying, we have grittiness, I have dryness, I have redness in my eye. Before this treatment, I was fine because glaucoma is asymptomatic in most of the other patients. So, when you have a decrease in the number of medications used, the patient becomes less symptomatic, he has to spend less money and he has to remember less to put on those drops. The family also has less hassles to remind the old patient to keep on instilling drops in the eyes. Whereas in the only FACO group, the, there was a relative increase, maybe just a statistical variation, a random variation. We don't expect an increase, generally there is a decrease by uh, one millimeter or so after FACO, but the number of medications used did not decrease in the FACO alone group. Now the authors have mentioned 10 reasons for doing a combined FACO emulsification ECP surgery. Because number one, it is easy to perform and less time consuming, takes an addition only few minutes over and above FACO emulsifier, FACO emulsification. It is titrable because it's up to you how much of ciliary body you destroy and hence there is lesser chance of hypotony. You can always take up the other remaining quadrants later on if hypotony is not there. In trabeculectomy, when we do a filtering surgery, we have to call our patients more often and we have to call them for a longer period of time. When we do a FACO, we call them only next day and then many of us call only after one month. Some of us may call one visit more in between. Similar is the follow-up requirement after ECP as well. So follow-up means less money spent by the patient, less time spent by us. So there are no long-term complications as we, we shall see in the slides which are going to come. The conjunctiva remains undisturbed. Since conjunctiva has not been disturbed, therefore, the conjunctiva is still amenable to future filtering surgeries. Now, another study, Chen et al. in 1997, reported a 90% success rate for treating refractory glaucoma, refractory glaucoma, not responding to the usual treatment modalities. The mean area of treatment was 300 degrees in their cases, and the follow-up was mean 30 months. 34% decrease in IOP and a 38% decrease in glaucoma medications was noted by them. 94% eyes shows visual improvement. So there was the ECP collaborative study group also. So a very, very large study, you see 5824. And long-term complications of ECP was seen. And the follow-up was 
equal to 30 years, meaning 5.2 years. In short, this appears to be a very promising procedure for managing cases of glaucoma and especially more promising when we have to combine cataract surgery with glaucoma. Though it has been recommended in all types of glaucoma, whether open angle or narrow angle, in narrow angle also if the if there is anterior synechia and you find that pressure is not controlled even after PI, then this procedure can also be done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ajina, sir. Sir, we will be very dil se padate, se pehle padate. Big, big round of applause for. You know, you came when you introduce me and when you talk about me like this, I always feel so flattered. Sir, I don't know. वो मैं सोचता हूँ मैं क्या इंट्रोड्यूस कराऊँ? इस हस्ती को क्या इंट्रोड्यूस कराऊँ? बस एक ही है कि सर बस आ गई है. Thank you, sir. Uh, our second talk is on use of video endoscopic systems in ophthalmology this is, uh, regarding some retinal aspects, use of this machine and it is none other than Dr. Upsham Goyal who I have been always calling as Upsham Boss. So, I will tell you a little bit about him. Do you want to tell him? Tell him. He is a postgraduate in ophthalmology from KGM and fellow of Medical Research Foundation Chennai and is in practice, clinical chair practice from past 25 years. He is a well-known, renowned surgeon of our city and he has got many firsts to his uh, credit and the most important thing is, is he is very close to our heart. So may I request Dr. Upsham Goel to please come forward a big round of applause for him for the use of video endoscopic systems in ophthalmology. He will be touching the uh, posse segment part. Thank you so much. Uh, on the very outset, uh, let me thank each one of you, or my friends, and uh, all my lovely and dear colleagues, for taking out time for um, uh, today. Uh, so, uh, before I start, uh, do I have a permission to uh, let's get the machine in order? Yes, that, that we should do first. Uh, so, uh, may I request uh, our uh, most beloved uh, teachers, uh, Professor Rajiv Nath, uh, Professor Padam Sir, to come over and. Uh, uh, inaugurate the machine for us. Ankit Bhaiya. Ankit Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Look at the technology. This, what sir had already told us about 18 gauge, and uh, following that, they developed the 20 gauge. Now, look at this probe, and these are the, the fibers, and this is the laser, and this is teeny little thing is the camera, all within the 20 gauge probe. And yet I waited. And this is the laser which has been switched on now. And the fibers, the good thing is that you can control. So here you have the three ports here. This is the laser port. And this is the camera. And this is your illumination port. So the advantage is you can, for the good photography or even for visualization, you can change the illumination levels for each one of them. So that's the advantage there. Now that's brighter, you know. So the previous one was. So less bright, so I just showed you how you can keep changing the brightness. But now I waited because the 20 gauge technology was already there, but I kept on waiting because I had already shifted my vitro retinal surgery from 20 gauge to 23 gauge to 25 to 27. So I waited for years for this probe to come along, and that's 23 gauge. Look at the crazy kind of technology. They already had a 450 micron camera sitting in that little probe and this one comes with a camera size of 350 microns. Some people might still like 20 gauge probe though because it gives you a wider field of view. But the quality of the optics is already very very good. And there you go. You just go there, uh, calculate it, pull back and then go on to the next. Or you can keep on sweeping it. 
The good thing is that you can treat the 360 degree ciliary body and you will not have hypotony. Why? Because the ciliary epithelium is lying in the crypts also. Despite treating the crypts and the base, you are, you are treating barely 40% of the ciliary epithelium. So that is something wonderful because being able to do all that and still not have a hypotony is great. Now, when you counsel the patient, don't tell him that I'm going to do a surgery which is going to get you rid of glaucoma because that may not happen. The patient may still need to be under glaucoma medication, but often the medication is much better controlled. I mean, the glaucoma is much better controlled, and often the patient is able to reduce the medication. Rubiotic glaucomas, people have been talking about it. Initial days is wonderful, and then everything starts going back again. So, in rubiotic glaucoma, do the laser, do put a vaccine or whatever measure you want. And as soon as the media clears up, which it will, because the, the, this patient oh, whom I did, the very next day, the media was clear enough for me to uh, start doing laser. So, you know, that's that's the kind of an advantage. You still have to do your PRP. You still want to treat right, even up to the aura or even beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Richard. So, now, uh, I'll invite Mr. Richard, and I must tell you, that he has been involved globally for this ophthalmic endoscopy since 1995 and he has assisted in training of many surgeons in many countries for this particular procedure and he has been routinely giving lectures for, endo for ophthalmic endoscopy in International Ophthalmology Congress including Uretina, AAO, ES, CRS, WOC and has done many presentations for this aspect. So what I believe is that he is into this technology for past 20 years. So it would not be uh, unwise to say that this thin uh, probe which he will be showing us has light, has got a camera, has got a laser and I think has got Mr. Richard inside it. Ah. So all four inside. <laughs> so may, so may I, may I uh, just request Mr. Richard to please come to the dais and proceed with his presentations. Mr. Richard, please. Well, once again, thank you very much for taking time out of your weekend to uh, attend this symposium. And I, I want to thank the, the speakers and, and the professor, uh, professor for uh, really uh, being so gracious uh, both to attend and to present. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of uh, endoscopy uh, beyond just endocycle photocoagulation. Uh, I'll show you some of the indications in posterior segment surgery, uh, in uh, new emerging uh, applications in uh, cornea, in oculoplastic, uh, trauma management, and others. Am I speaking loud enough? Can yeah, people sure. hear me in the back? Okay, great. So, I'm going to show you just quickly this film here because it shows the unique vantage points you get from the endoscope. This is a pars plana view of the underside of the iris and the pseudo exfoliative case. You can see that pseudo ex material coating the zonules, the capsule remnant. This is a, an IOL that's dropped, uh, as you know, uh, with pseudo X, the zonules often are uh, very uh, fragile. Um, a good use for the endoscope for the cataract surgeons among you, I know pseudo X you don't see very often, but even in the case of a, a bad capsular rexus, being able to use the endoscope to visualize the capsular zonule complex can often keep you from having to send the patient to the retina surgeon to fish an IOL out. So. Uh, rather uniquely, I think, uh, unlike perhaps any other instrument in, in your uh, operating theaters, the endoscope can be used in a wide range of subspecialties, from glaucoma management, vitreoretinal surgery, complications from cataract surgery, ocular trauma management, ocular plastic surgery, cornea, and it's widely uh, used in research uh, and teaching institutions around the world and new emerging applications are, are coming out really every year. Uh, at Moorfields, they're uh, presenting a paper at the upcoming year retina meeting on managing uh, uh, choroidal melanomas uh, with the endoscope. So uh, each year we see new applications emerge. So I'm going to give a, a quick brief technology overview. I, I know um, it's been discussed 
briefly, but I just want to reiterate the components of the endoscope include a diode laser, a xenon light source, medical grade uh, video components, and while we have an 810 nanometer laser in the box, which is, uh, as the professor noted, ideally suited to being absorbed by the pigmented ciliary epithelium, the 810 wavelength, you can run a 532, you know, a green laser, a 577, yellow laser, through the endoscope as well. Um, in Zurich, they're, they're doing eczema laser trabeculoplasty of the endoscope. So a wide range of laser wavelengths are compatible with the, with the system. We also do make a smaller system without an integrated laser. Um, it's a somewhat economical alternative if you already own uh, lasers uh, and have them in the OR. This interfaces with virtually every 532 and solid state 810 laser uh, available on the market today. Really our technology is the endoscope. Uh, we didn't invent video endoscopy, we didn't invent light sources or, or uh, uh, certain lasers, but integrating the three components into a single pan piece is a unique uh, globally patented technology that endooptics developed uh, beginning in the mid-1990s. Our endoscopes now range, as has been noted, from 18 gauge to 23 gauge, so 0.6 millimeters to 0.12 or 1.2, with resolutions from 10 to 17,000 pixels, and fields of view now from 120 to 140. The endoscopes also are unique in that they're autoclavable. There is no autoclavable endoscope available anywhere in the world for any other medical subspecialty. Um, they are limited reuse in that the heat of the autoclave over time can break them down. But in India, I note that many both uh, large institutions and private clinics often have ethylene oxide gas as a sterilization option. If you have that resource, the endoscopes last indefinitely. They're not damaged by the ETO. Unless they're physically damaged, they'll last for a very, very long time. So the, the cost per case is really quite low. And as I mentioned, they're compatible with a range of third-party lasers. So this slide is meant to show the evolution of the endoscope from the late 1990s, our original 3,000 pixel. This is the first BCP case ever video ever done on a human with the integrated endoscope. The 6,000 pixel endoscopes that we introduced in the early 2000s, and now our current 10,000 and 17,000 pixel endoscopes. And you can see the field of view is enhanced quite a bit, really with panoramic views now available. Again, the scopes come on curved and straight in a wide range of, um, of gauges. So, as I mentioned, virtually every ophthalmic subspecialty can utilize the endoscope for certain applications. In glaucoma, they're quite broad. Uh, the most uh, talked about, uh, perhaps the most commonly practiced, is ECP, usually combined with FACO. Um, I'll talk about ECP plus a little bit later. And I'm also going to introduce you to some other techniques, including endoscopic cycloplasty for those intractable narrow angle cases that you mentioned earlier, endoscopic goniotomy, uh, which is uh, quite in vogue among pediatric glaucoma specialists. I'll show you how that works. Endoscopic gonioscopy uh, to facilitate other angle-based surgeries. Uh, many uh, young surgeons in North America and Europe dispensed with the gonioscope for a lot of these angle-based surgeries if they're implanting some of the uh, MIGS devices like iStent. In lieu of a gonio lens, uh, they use the endoscope. Many of them combine the iStent or Zen or these angle-based techniques. With the endoscope in the eye, they do a light ECP treatment combining the two with a mechanism similar to using a prostaglandin and a CAI for example, you know, you're modulating both inflow and outflow. So we've been doing it medically for years and years. Surgeons are beginning to consider doing it surgically. And then uh, treating uh, PAS, uh, gonioceniculiasis, uh, uh, with the endoscope. Again, people use the endoscope both for visualization and in lieu of a spatula, so a one-handed technique through a parasympathesis. 
inspecting tubes, particularly placed uh, via pars plana, to ensure that the tube placement is optimized with no chance of occlusion. When tubes fail, using the endoscope to inspect that, that tube end, often there'll be an occlusion that can be easily removed instead of subjecting the patient to a more complicated secondary surgery. Vitreventral surgeons have embraced endoscopy, um, endoscopic vitrectomy, memory anectomy, um, PRP endoscopically. I'll show you examples of that. In inocular trauma management, it's really represented a breakthrough in managing severe ocular trauma accompanied by media opacities or corneal opacities. Anterior segment surgeons are using it as well, as I mentioned, in complicated cataracts. Managing a dislocated IOL, I'll show you a film uh, a little later on from Boris Maliugin from the Fiero Clinic on sulcus fixation of haptics under endoscopic view. Fast, precise, elegant, safe. You know, sometimes uh, in cataract surgery, you'll have an uneventful cataract. The patient comes back one month, two months later with persistent inflammation, not responding to meds. Very often with the endoscope through a clear corneal incision, you're able to have a look about. You'll see some, perhaps some residual cortex that was overlooked or a haptic out of the bag, uh, perhaps chafing against the ciliary complex. Under endoscopic view, quite easy to, uh, to uh, treat and most patients respond uh, nearly immediately to that. And then, as I mentioned, inspecting the zonular capsular complex in those cases of pseudo-X or uh, a rexus, capsular rexus that's gone badly. Oculoplastic surgeons use it for inspection of the lacrimal tract, um, endonasal endoscopic assisted DCR and endoscopic assisted intubation. Uh, those have generally been done with much larger diameter uh, rigid endoscopes. Our endonasal endoscope is 18 gauge giving plenty of room uh, in the nasal cavity for other instrumentation. Uh, surgeons seem to particularly appreciate it in, in children and, and women uh, where the nasal cavities are often quite small. And then uh, most recently uh, at Moorfield, at New York Dineer, uh, at Stanford University, there are several corneal specialists beginning to use the endoscope in, uh, in endothelial uh, grafts and DMEC, DSEC. Uh, to visualize the unfurling of the of the uh, Mellor graph. So I'm going to talk about glaucoma management fairly quickly since it's been covered. Um, ECP. So we've seen this film a few times. I, I won't subject you to it again. But simply to just reiterate, the only thing the endoscope is touching is the wound edges of the uh, primary incision. The iris is not being touched. Uh, properly uh, properly treated. This could be a sutureless combined uh, procedure. So, um, Professor you know, spoke at length about cyclodestructive procedures, and ECP is often referred to as a cyclo-ablative procedure in that we're not destroying the ciliary body as is done in cyclocryo and in uh, TCP. We're using very low laser energy, as I'll show you in a moment, selectively absorbed by the pigmented ciliary epithelium. Our target tissue, as you might imagine, is in fact the non-pigmented ciliary epithelial cells. Those are the cells that are actually secreting aqueous, and they are adjacent to these pigmented cells. So by thermally, by heating the pigmented cells, we are incapacitating the adjacent uh, secreting cells it has no effect on the ciliary vascular network or other tar non-targeted tissue. I'll show you uh, some histopathology uh, later on. Uh, the most common side effect with ECP uh, is mild transient inflammation. Most surgeons anticipating that possibility will instill uh, intracamerally or, or uh, subconjunctivally a little dexamethasone before completing the case. And it's very difficult to distinguish those eyes, even one day post-op, a phaco ECP eye from a phaco alone eye. And ECP can be performed as a primary surgical intervention on sighted eyes, which is something that you would think twice about doing TCP. TCP, by contrast, eye energy affecting everything from the conjunctiva through the sclera, the ciliary stroma, the vasculature. 
often missing the target tissue entirely because you're blindly delivering this. I, I mentioned uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Upsham that at the ESCRS last year, Professor uh, uh, Unimund from Erlangen University showed ADIs endoscopically to show the enormous variation in the orientation of, of ciliary processes. And every one of us, they're different. Sometimes they're very plump and uniform, like you see in the textbooks. Sometimes they're tiny little nubs. Sometimes they look like shark's teeth, almost two rows. Sometimes very anterior, even crowding the other side of the iris, causing iris plateau. Sometimes very posterior. So the one size fit all, fits all transscleral delivery often will miss the target tissue. Also, as has been well observed, the ciliary ring is actually somewhat of an ovoid, and the axis of that oval is different in every one of us. So doing a, 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 a circular treatment almost will ensure that you're going to be involving non-targeted tissue. So again, TCP is reserved for late stage intractable cases. This is an endoscopic view of TCP being applied. So we're using the endoscope, looking up. Here are the ciliary processes. Here is that pop that you hear with the attendant gas bubble, sure to induce some inflammation. Here again, the ciliary process is largely untouched. Here the processes are touched, but again, an over-treatment. Only the non-pigmented ciliary epithelial cells are secreting aqueous. There's no reason to destroy the ciliary stroma to break the blood aqueous barrier to involve other non-adjacent, non-impactful uh, tissues. So 1.2 to 2 watts of energy blindly delivered, causing significant collateral damage, high complication rates, from mild complications like pain and, and chronic inflammation to significant or devastating complications like hypotony and hysis. By contrast, the ECP is direct visualization, very low energy, 200 to 300 milliwatts under direct view, selectively absorbed by the pigmented ciliary epithelium, not involving the iris root or, or other non-impactful uh, tissue. And as a result, few risks and very, very few uh, serious complications associated. This is one of many histo histo uh, logical studies done. This is by Jorge Arroyo and his team at the University of California, San Francisco with Sean Lin, um, showing that the, just confirming that it's the pigmented ciliary epithelium that is being treated with very little uh, tissue beyond that being touched. So ECP is a versatile technique. Now, I don't want to, to tell you the glaucoma specialists among you that this is a magic bullet for every patient for any stage of glaucoma, for any mechanism of glaucoma. Of course it's not. But it is an important addition to any 21st century glaucoma practice. So uh, it's versatile in that you can treat both primary, open angle and narrow angle, including severe uh, cases of narrow angle like plateau iris. Uh, even uh, neovascular glaucoma from diabetic retinopathy or uh, retinal vein occlusion. Pediatric glau glaucoma responds quite well both to ECP and endoscopic gardeotomy. Secondary glaucoma is silconoil from trauma, pseudo-X. Those patients can also be candidates for ECP. So uh, again, uh, you know, reiterating, uh, over 15 years of, of clinical experience, ECP was the first minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, and it is the best study mix technique to date. If you look at some of the new mix devices being uh, being introduced, and look at the studies that they're presenting, small cohorts of patients with very short-term follow-up. Um, you know, we've been at this for actually closer to 20 years now, with over 200 published papers. So this is a very well-researched uh, technique. In patients at high risk of complications from filtration surgery, patients who failed previous tubes and trabs, uh, long axial lengths, patients with corneal grafts, patients on anticoagulants, 
they could be uniquely well suited for uh, for DCP. It's, a, it's really a nice option for those challenging patient, patients that often don't respond well to an additional filtration procedure. So, FECO BCP has more or less supplanted combined phaco trabeculectomy. Um, in North America and Europe, it's very rare for someone to combine trabs with phaco. Of course, I think it's been widely observed that you risk compromising both the phaco and the trab by combining them. This is not the case with ECP. Um, it's you know, a faster, lower risk procedure with a predictable drop in pressure. You can do a, a wonderful trab, and, and, I, and you know, trab is still the gold standard. It's an incredibly important technique and will continue to be for a large number of, of patients. Um, but there are many patients that you don't need to put to uh, the risk that, that traps often represent. So again, not associated with devastating complications, predictable clinical outcomes, even induced astigmatism. You know, I know a lot of you don't think you're getting much astigmatism with your traps, but if you really study it, you'll see as often as not, you're inducing a little bit. Now, I know that's not across the board, and many of you have very evolved techniques, but there are many surgeons who are doing traps that will routinely induce some astigmatism. So if you've had a patient, pick a VIP patient that you've done a premium IOL on, and, and now you're going to send them uh, to a trap or do a trap in that same uh, procedure, you might want to consider some, some other options. And we think ECP is uh, a, a reasonable option to consider. So this is a quick film, and I'll go through it quickly because uh, there are a number of more slides. But I wanted to show you, uh, you know, a complete procedure from A to Z. Uh, here, the the, the bed, bed procedure is being completed. Telon is being injected. It's very important to get it under the iris, so you really want to be infusing it at the edge of the iris, because again, we're trying to push the iris forward and push the anterior capsule back. Go through this. A little quickly, but just more or less to show you in real time, I'll, I'll stop here only to show you this interesting view of an iridotomy, and, and look at this fiber material that's beginning to develop below the wall, this, this, that's a, kind of an interesting view. Grab it again, just to show you know, in real time, this took about uh, three minutes and, and 20 seconds for him. So, you know, I, I know I, I'm always astonished here in India to see how, how fast, how skilled uh, your, your cataract surgery is, how, how quick you're getting these patients in and out. And a combined procedure where you can add a couple of minutes to, to treat the glaucoma component as well, maybe something that's you know, well suited um, here to the, you know, your, your high volume of quick practices. So we've more or less divided it into three zones. ECP light is reserved for children, pediatric glaucoma. Um, of course, you ne would never want to over-treat, so uh, pediatric specialists are very conservative with ECP because they know they can go back in and do an additional quadrant, or as a patient ages, uh, treat more. Uh, but again, when you're combining it with, uh, with some outflow therapies, uh, a light 180 degree treatment uh, seems to be a nice adjunctive treatment. Standard ECP generally ranges now from 270 to 360 degrees, and as I'll show you in very refractory cases, super intractable, or as Dr. Spath calls it, ultra-refractory glaucoma, ECP plus, which is a pars plana treatment of 360 degrees, plus a confluent ring just below the ciliary processes, so almost the pars placata, um, and, treat, and really generating profound pressure drops. Of course, there's the attendant increased risk. So the risks of inducing hypotony here are very real. And so I'm just gonna go through quickly a couple of them and then we'll move on to other applications. But these are kind of typical results. This is uh, another large multicentral study. And again, if you look at these numbers, you rarely see that in glaucoma uh, studies for mixed devices. Um, so kind of typical results. Uh, as illustrated earlier, with with concurrent uh, reductions of medications, the compliance of medications is a worldwide problem. The study that the professor showed earlier from Dr. Burke, 
the goal of that study was to eliminate the meds as a, as a sensible one. Again, many of our studies go out beyond five and eight years, some as long as 12 years. This is the Berg study, so I, I, I won't do that again. But I just want to point out that the FACO group, uh, it, it wasn't apparent um, earlier, but the FACO alone group did have a pressure reduction. You've all seen that in your patients, I'm sure. There is a pressure reduction, but it's a transient pressure reduction. This study has been replicated now at King Khalid Medical Center, at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and in every case, they showed after about 15 months, the IOP and the FACO alone group began to increase again, and by the end of the three-year study period, they were back at preoperative levels, both with meds and IOP. And, and this was a study done uh, in the UK where they kept the meds the same. They wanted to augment medical control of glaucoma with ECP to see what the pressure lowering of ECP alone was. And you can see pretty profound here from 21.5 to about 14.5. So about a 35% pressure drop without any change in medications. We have studies, and, and for those of you who left your email address, I will uh, send you a link to our global user group site. Uh, this is a continuing education site uh, for ophthalmic endoscopists called the Endoscopic Vision Alliance. And many of the studies, virtually I'd say nearly all of the studies published to date um, are posted on it, uh, not only for glaucoma, but in vitreo as well. So you can look up these studies yourselves. But just to give you the summaries, this was done by Jorge uh, uh, excuse me, Francisco Lima, president of the Brazilian uh, Ophthalmic Society this year, uh, comparing tubes to traps, and you can see uh, he had profound pressure drops in both cases. He's coming via pars plana here, so this is a 360 degree um, ECP, but the complications were considerably lower in the ECP group. And this is a very short term study, you can see. Uh, barely 20 months. So I think it's fair to assume that since most complications associated with glaucoma drainage devices are, are longer term complications, tube failures, uh, valve failures, they don't generally happen in the first 19 months. So I think over time we would see even a more profound difference in, in complications. Uh, this is a, a, a study showing patients who have failed a previous trap uh, excuse me, a, a previous uh, tube, and here they're coming from the limbus with 360 degree ECP, 88% success rate of one in two years, 30% decrease in pressure, significant reduction in medication, and on these challenging eyes, no reports of ISIS or hypotheses. So these are pretty fragile eyes, you know, I think you'll agree generally. I want to talk to you about endocycloplasty quickly. You know, I, I know uh, throughout Asia Pacific, the incidence of, of uh, Plateau Iris Syndrome is a little higher than in other parts of the world, so I expect that the glaucoma specialists among you see it from time to time. Um, it was observed by Ike Ahmed and his team at the University of Toronto that in those challenging cases that weren't responding to the lensectomy and, and uh, iridotomy, um, that under UVM observation, there was no change actually in the angle of architecture. The crowding of the angle by the very large and anteriorly placed ciliary processes was not attended to at all. So Dr. Ahmed uh, developed this technique he calls endocycloplasty. This work. And, and what he observed is when, when he treats, the processes rotate posteriorly physically opening the space above them. So I'll show you the UVMs before and after. So after the lensectomy, the iris flopped down nicely, but you can see in this untreated temporal angle here, there's been no change at all to the angle architecture. It's closed as it was before the surgery. Where he did the ECP treatment or endocycloplasty treatment, this patient is benefiting from suppressed aqueous production plus a significantly opened angle. So this has been very well received all around the world, this technique of endocycloplasty for these challenging uh, 
narrow angle case. And you can see he had a pretty significant uh, drop in, in uh, IOP with an attendant drop in meds and no significant complications associated with this. He just did a follow-up study at the American Glaucoma Society about two weeks ago now, and uh, I, I don't have the follow-up slides, but the uh, effect was uh, protracted. I think he was reporting now of 44 months uh, with similar IOP reduction and, and uh, reduction in medication. So, as I mentioned, using the endoscope and low Gagne lens, this technique of endoscopic goniotomy for babies, uh, I know probably not many of you treat uh, children, but you know these babies often have very high pressures, corneal edema, ca causing cloudiness, opacities that make doing a goniotomy microscopically very challenging. So we developed this little knife that fits right on the endoscope, like a bayonet. You're able to have a magnified view of the angle and dissect uh, under direct observation. I apologize, the video quality is a little poor, but this is the view. You can see the blade tip out ahead, and here he's treating the animal under direct observation. The children seem to respond to this you know, fairly well. Um, there have been no large-scale studies, rare patients, but there have been many case studies, and many of them are reported on in the visual line of sight. Now I'll talk to you just briefly about ECP Plus, where, as I mentioned, it's a pars plana application of uh, treating not just the ciliary processes, but a, a confluent ring of laser energy, almost on the pars or just below the ciliary ring. With this technique, you're really able to create enormous pressure drops. There is the attendant risk. As mentioned, from the anterior approach, only 35 to 40 percent of the ciliary uh, epithelial cells secreting aqueous can be visualized, so the laser can only reach 35 to 40 percent of them through an anterior approach, so through a limbal or a corneal incision. If you come via pars plana, you can you can reach and treat a much larger uh, number of these secreting cells. So there is a risk of hypotony in these patients. But even here, the risk of hypotony associated with ECP plus is considerably lower than, than conventional therapies for these patients. Certainly the TCP, uh, very likely uh, significantly less than TRABS as well. So let me show you uh, the small scale study. I, I, I know it's a small study, but it was done by George Spaeth and Associates at Will's Eye, so I, I think it has some significant credibility. You can see these patients all have maximal medi uh, medication, um, 3.5 previous surgeries. Of note, look at how young the average age here is, barely 40 years. So you can see the mean IOP reduced from 25 to 10 meds almost by 75 percent, from nearly four to about one. But I think particular note, vision unchanged in 82 percent of these cases. That's something that you wouldn't likely see with TCP. So you know we think it's a, an option to consider for those really ultra refractory cases that otherwise you might treat uh, transdermally. As I mentioned. Uh, anterior segment applications from suture fixation of IOLs through the sulcus. I don't know if there are any pediatric specialists among you, but uh, you know, for those who manage Marfan syndrome, those babies often need lensectomies and suture uh, supported lenses, or uh, sulcus supported lenses. Very small sulcus. Uh, being able to visualize that, and I'll show you this technique, this ab interno technique of, of, of suture placement that's really kind of revolutionized treating these babies, uh, facilitating challenging cataract cases, and generally improving search quality and outcomes. So let me see if I can get this film to play. So this is Dr. Maliugin uh, showing uh, another type of view. So he's, he's coming now uh, using the endoscope to look at an ab external introduction of the uh, needle here. So 
in this technique, you place the endoscope into the sulcus, turn on the red aiming beam, you'll see a bright red dot on the sclera that will tell you where you can safely place that needle. But it's a little tricky, it's a bimanual technique. This is the original um, microendoscopy system that we developed in the 1990s. The Funer Clinic now owns four systems, actually seven of them throughout Russia, because there are five Funer Clinics. So if you saw that last bit, this technique was putting the, endos the needle right on the endoscope, coming ab interno, here you can see the needle, Visualize the sulcus. Very safe placement. Quick, elegant, predictable. I'll talk to you uh, briefly about uh, retina. I'm sure most of you are getting hungry and thirsty now, so five more minutes and, and we should wrap here. Uh, just to make the point that, again, a long clinical history. The device was actually developed for use in the posterior segment by a retinal specialist. It was embraced by the glaucoma community for ECP and more or less usurped, as some people say. But now with our higher resolution 23 gauge, glaucoma specialists around the world are, are really uh, embracing endoscopy. So this is the kind of eye that through the operating microscope would obviously be challenging with the endoscope. This is the first generation 6,000 pixel endoscope. But even with that, he's able to have a panoramic view to determine that surgery is indicated here. You see the sclerotomy being fashioned. Uh, you'll note that he's going to do a start of the trectomy here. And the vitreous, as you start to do it, and discover the trectomy, looks like snow almost. Because the light and the camera are coaxial on the endoscope, things that look opaque or that look uh, translucent through the operating microscope, like some of these little residual bands and membranes, very difficult to visualize through the operating microscope, are quite apparent with the coaxial illumination of the endoscope. So often people can forego staining from membrane membraneectomies because they can visualize uh, the membrane just with the endoscope alone. And now he's going on to PRP with the same instrument. So for the retina surgeons among you, it's a light pipe, it's an endo laser fiber, and an intraocular camera. Here, another patient, you'd be pretty much out of luck um, through the operating microscope. This is an endophthalmitis case. That was actually a PK um, that had wounds, dehiscence, and infection as we go. Uh, but again, with the endoscope, you're able to go in, visualize, and with the protractor, uh, remove all of this uh, infection, infected tissue. There was a, a case study uh, just done by Jeff Heyer uh, in Boston and by uh, uh, Dr. Boucher at the American Hospital in Paris uh, showing success rates in these patients who generally have a very poor prognosis of uh, 60 to 65 percent saves in these cases of severe recurrent endophthalmitis. You know, many of these patients have patent retina underneath and they get in early before necrosis starts. And they, this is a, a very nice indication for, for, for the endoscope. So it's useful anytime your view is obstructed, your microscopic view, either due to corneal opacity, small pupils, blood in the AC, even as something as simple as condensation on a lens when you're doing an air fluid exchange, you lose visualization. Uh, having the endoscope can be the difference between completing that case safely. You're able to view the far periphery without scleral depression and anatomic distortion. Um, you also have, you know, a lot of retinologists at first were very hesitant to adopt the endoscope. They said, hey, I can see everything I need to see with my biome, with my wide field viewing device. We don't want to argue that the endoscopic view <coughs> compares with the microscope view. No chance, of course. The beautiful stereo optics that you get via the microscope um, can't be duplicated in a fiber optic endoscope. But the additional views that the endoscope can afford you for things like a foreign body, an interocular foreign body, being able to view that from both the top-down perspective of the microscope 
and the interocular view often allows you to plan a safer uh, procedure, a, a higher quality procedure than you might if you had the up, top down view only. So, uh, you hear? So there are a lot of you know, a lot of techniques for retina and endoscopes that are just one-handed techniques: right. observation, lasering, finding small bleeders, and lasering. One-handed techniques very easy to adopt. The two-handed techniques there is a learning curve, and uh, it's it's not insignificant. But for those who accept the challenge and acquire the skills, it enormously broadens their treatment options for these most challenging patients. So uh, again, you know, key applications, dislocated lenses, drop nucleus, you know, drop ILLs, recurrent endophthalmitis, intraocular foreign bodies, neovascularization, um, including NVG, uh, PVR, you know, one of the really, again, game-changing techniques for treating PVR with concurrent uh, Ciliary, epiciliary membranes, often these patients become hypotenus and there's really not a good prognosis for most of them. Very difficult to visualize these membranes uh, through the operating microscope. With the endoscope you're able to quite easily visualize, I won't say easily, but more easily visualize and dissect these membranes under endoscopic view. And again, a couple of uh, recent studies showing save rates approaching 75% of those patients, restoring IOP in patients whose prognosis otherwise was very, very poor. Every U.S. military hospital, uh, as of 2006, has adopted uh, endoscopy for treating patients where they're previously doing temporary cryoprosthesis on. Um, every Canadian military hospital, every Japanese, every UK, every German military hospital now has adopted endoscopy for these super challenging uh, trauma cases. This is a short film, hopefully this will play. This is by Khalid al uh, Professor al from Kuwait University. This was a six-year-old child who had an air, air pellet gun bullet. His brother shot him uh, in the eye. So he's able to see this blood clot remove. Some of this was very dense. So just pulling at that uh, at that intraocular foreign body without having first uh, removed that blood clot incarcerating it would have probably created more atrogenic damage. But here he's able to remove it rather handily. You can see the retina completely detached here. He's going to pull this through the, uh, through the cornea in a moment and then he'll go back in under endoscopic view, reattach the, uh, the retina and this child actually did uh, quite well. Um, he obviously had a, a, a chronograph uh, subsequently. Anyway, so you know, sparing the carotid prosthesis with the endoscope, a severe trauma case with hazy media, you're able to go through a 23 gauge trocar, have a panoramic view of the retina, determine whether surgery is even indicated. You know, very often you can spare the patient any more trauma. There, there's really not much you can do. Um, you can dispense with the carotid prosthesis, and so just fewer interventions by going in directly into stock. Um, again, uh, many uh, retinal surgeons treat neovascular glaucoma via pars plana, so they're, they're in the eye, they're doing PRP into the far peripheral retina, often involving even the pars plana, uh, and then they'll do uh, ECP uh, on these CVRO patients or, or, or uh, diabetic retinopathy patients with very good outcomes. And then, you know, finally, in, in uh, managing uh, ECR, are there any oculoplasts among us? No? Okay. Oh, one? Okay. But again, with that, that big instrumentation, having a small endoscope in a child's nasal cavity or a woman's nasal, nasal cavity can sometimes be a little more comfortable uh, working than using a Know, a three or four millimeter rigid uh, endoscope. So just in concluding, we believe the endoscope is a, a, a worthwhile device in every 21st century ophthalmic practice. Again, uh, a wide range of subspecialties can use it. It's an enhancement to the surgical armamentarium, allowing more refined surgery in many cases. 
and challenging cases can be a game changer, time saving in many procedures, certainly are patient friendly and a great uh, teaching tool. Uh, of course, you can document treatments uh, with uh, recording to uh, any, any types of media. So I'm sorry for the length of that. Thank you very much for your time. We have a quick 10 minute discussion for any question and answers. So I'm handing over the mics to you now so that you, if there are any questions you can ask, please. That, uh, as you were mentioning, that the cost of the procedure, like cost of the glaucoma medication is reduced once you do this procedure. But uh, I feel that procedure itself must be an expensive procedure because the uh, machine involved is an expensive. So if you see in the long term, I'm not too sure about it. How much? Yeah, yeah in can perspective because yeah. here yeah. it's not reversible. It's right. not insurance. Exactly. So yeah, I'm not too. There are so many types of costs involved. Yes. There is one thing called direct cost. Second is indirect cost, and the third is intangible cost, which you cannot measure. Yeah. Now treatment involves not only the eye cost of the eye drop. Somebody has to go to the market to buy it, the cost of the fuel, the cost of the time, and then the cost of not treating. If the patient is unable to get the medicine on time and he remains untreated for a month or for a few weeks, that again increases the cost of the treatment as in whole. So this is a one-time investment. I know, and sir, but that is a recurrent you are just reducing the dose, you are not stopping the medicine. Supposingly, Supposingly, the patient is continuing with one medicine, whatever, like yeah. initially we were using two medicines or three medicines. Even if he is continuing to use one medicine, uh, post ACP, in that case also the same factor what you are saying, the cost involved, all these things will remain same. Yeah. Yeah, only thing is that you are taking buying two medicines or three yeah. medicines, that's the only difference. Uh, I think I'd like to answer that. Uh, as most, I think uh, all the glaucoma specialists here would agree that let's say you set a target pressure of 18 okay now getting a target pressure of 18 through surgery is very different from getting a target pressure of 18 through medicines why because the pressure fluctuations are much better controlled when you've done the surgery than with medicines ever in the same medicine uh, in the same patient if you have 18 pressure and you do a water ring provocation you will still find the pressure is going to maybe 24 25 even above whereas an operated case it's not going to happen same thing occurs here interestingly though we haven't proven it i don't think we really have the studies to do that but that's my very limited uh, observation which i've already seen is that these patients who have already had a ciliary body destruction have decreased capacity to produce aqueous and that's the beauty of it so your pressure fluctuations are likely to be less and so therefore on a the long-term basis you may actually end up with having a much better outcome not not just the pressures Please, but at the same time, like I was just mentioning that Dr. Bhaskar is there, Dr. Arun is there, we already discussed that, that we can do it for free for a patient who is poor and we can do it in the college because such a small machine which we just have to take. So cost is something which is in our hands I mean, because our skills and once you buy a machine, the costs are in our hands. The cost of medicine is not in our hands. The cost of medicine is in the hands of the companies. They, they won't give it to, to us for free. <laughs> yeah. If I, I can make one more point, uh, there was a, a study done and in their calculation of cost, they included complications management. And trabeculectomy did not fare particularly well when they included the cost of complications management. So that's you know, something not to overlook, at least. And, and you know, again, because the instrument is quite versatile, our hope is that, that institutions are buying it and, and amortizing the cost over not just the glaucoma service, but the retinologist, the oculoplast, the cornea, so cataract, we'll see. But at any rate, it's a very good point. And uh, in this particular machine, in this uh, laser system, so we are, you are using diode, diode laser in this. Very Other good. lasers can also be used in yeah, this. Exactly. Independent, independent ones also. You're right. So you can use No, a, but for this, this inherent is just a diode laser? No, so or not, you yeah. have? Yeah. yeah, so this is, the, it, the integrated laser is a diode laser. Almost any third-party lasers, ice, nitec. In that case, or any laser can be used. Or the adapters are the same. The adapters yes. the same. Not, not any lasers. The only those which do not interfere with the vision. 
with a monitor view. Well, Some of the laser, like argon laser, will blind you. That's a very good point. It will not blind. Um, argon laser will blind the view Which on the monitor. Laser? Well, we can use? well, now you can use the green lasers because we actually have a 532 filter. Originally, we did not. And really, people do ECP with the 532 laser as well. A lot of retinologists do. The reason 810 was because it's pretty good at absorbing the, the, the melanin in the, in the pigmented ciliary epithelium. But the green laser had a flash, and then, as you say, you lose visualization. But now we have a 532 filter in the video couplet. So that's for all, all, all of them, including all of them. Uh, these machines? Exactly. Oh, so that's you, right. so you can go ahead and, and treat with 532 with no longer the green flash that we used to experience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for asking some very nice questions. Yes, Dr. Alloy. Dr. Alloy is a retina person we know very well. And, uh, so I, think, uh, and his, uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify one thing. Uh, for the faking patients, if we are going in, uh, uh, you are recommending a parse plan up approach for a faking patient, or you want the anti hydrogen shampoo to your model approach? No, you want, you want. Because I am very skeptical going, yeah. he, even with the heel on up there in a young yeah. patient with a clear lens. Yeah, I, 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 I can't say that there's no risk in, in doing, uh, thank you guys, there is. And you should have some experience before you would consider that. And typically, a young patient, you wouldn't treat a young patient. You might treat a patient my age who, you know, five years will likely have a cataract anyway, uh, because a lot of these iatrogenic cataracts don't come up one month post-op, it's, you know, two years post up. So, uh, and surgeons who are doing it now are using the 23 gauge in lieu of the 20 gauge, using a Helon GV or a Helon 5 uh, for a little extra, uh, you know, uh, inflation of the sulcus, if you will. Um, but it seems even if you don't touch the lens, there is a, a chance of inducing uh, IGR because you will be firing the laser quite quite close to the. Uh, uh, yes, but the laser isn't the issue because uh, the 532 of even the even, won't even if, if it's not a lens touch, a physical touch, yeah. the laser can cause the damage well, to the capsule. You know, I think conceptually the the 810 laser uh, won't be absorbed by the avascular media. So that's why the, you know, people often ask, it's on their integrity, are you marginalizing that? Will I hurt the capsule? Anything that's avascular won't absorb the 810 wavelength. But something is going on, you're right. And, and so you don't, we think, you don't even need to physically touch it. Now I will say, um, in the latest studies that have been done, there's been about a 14 to 16% incidence of iatrogenic cataract in faith guys with a 23 gauge endoscope. It doesn't compare too unfavorably even to some ad, ad external techniques. So I, I think that you know, the incidence of iatrogenic cataract is not unique to, uh, to ECP, but it's something that you want to reserve, I would say, for patients, okay. for older patients, um, and uh, you know, once you've had some experience. So uh, in summary, what I would say that Probably if you are having a pseudo-thinking patient with an intractable glaucoma or you want to add it on to a, your FACO surgeries, yeah. it's a perfectly uh, approach uh, to go in the addresses segment. Yes. But if you have a faking patient, maybe a young patient, a past and approach should be better. Or uh, you, can, you, can, you, you can hit the lens on your past plate as well. I'd say consider another technique. There, there's, a, there's, there's a slight technological limitation there also that the curve probe, as of now, it comes only in 20 gauge. That's correct. The 23 is not a right. curve probe. Right. That's a bit of a problem. We're, we are working on that, that because that's exactly the question. Because because that's that would actually answer yeah, your question. That's what I think. That yeah. If, if, the, yeah, if you use a curve solution. probe, the yeah. approach will be easier, it will be safer. Absolutely. Agreed. And the posterior capsule will also be safer if you go to the past. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Doctor. So that was just done. Yeah. I have a slight variant to this. I think I'm audible. Uh -huh. I have a slight variant the problem presented by Dr. Loy. Uh, say I have a patient, hypothetically I have a patient with neovascular glaucoma whose vision is very poor, maybe just PL plus, PR yeah. inaccurate with vitreous hemorrhage yeah. and with a heart cataract. And this sort of feature is not very uncommon. We, we very see yeah. some of these patients. What approach should we prefer in that? Would we approach it with an endoscope at all or what should we do? Or should we remove the cataract? 
then do it with an anterior approach. Come, come over sometime. I'll show you some of the videos uh, of which we already recorded. I have them here, but I think the time is less. You see what's happening? Like this patient, I entered. The moment I entered, it was already bleeding. There was such a huge amount of rebuses. So there, probably I would, you know, finish off the laser and come away. Finish off my avasti. Finish from the laser and come away. And then do the cataract infusion. Because cataract is not going to come in the way of treatment of the, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, laser ciliary body. So. Attending the cataract, we can do as a second stage procedure. Uh, yeah, but we will not get enough space. In a, also. in a brown cataract, you will not have enough space going in. Oh, there is enough space. There will be? Absolutely no problem. Absolutely. If you are hinting at difficulty index in doing a phaco emulsification being greater, you can combine this with SICS also. SICS can be combined with these things, isn't it? No, no, his main concern was keep, because of these black and black brown cataracts, the space is very limited. That's why you use Elon. So you remove the cataract first and then do ECP just as we were talking about. No, sir, but he's talking about rheumatic glaucoma. You know you're going to. Oh, you're talking about rheumatic glaucoma. I missed that part, sorry. It breathes suddenly, you know. That's that's more of a concern. So, thank you, everyone. And I don't think I can thank enough everyone. Thank you so much for giving your valuable time, and especially in the weekend. And. I would also congratulate uh, Dr. Ukshan Goel and the entire team of Lucknow Tannik Society for doing such a wonderful job and uh, it's very good to see you all here and uh, congratulations once again for having the first machine in Ovin 23 gauge in UP and uh, I hope more and more machines will come and we will do a continuous support and thanks to the Lens Home who is our partner in India and he is our distributor for entire BDI products. And special thanks to the local guys here, Tushar and Devinder. Thanks a lot.